you have to hit the record button too? Yeah, well, it's, it's loading everything up right now. Okay. Okay. And we are live. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. It's my great honor and privilege tonight to have Dr. Murray Sabern joining me. Doctor, thank you for coming tonight. Well, thank you, JR, for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, Doctor is going to be joining us uh, on a monthly basis. We're very pleased to announce. And uh, we've got a lot of different topics to talk about. Uh, we've got the books that he's uh, written. Of course, uh, Doctor, you've been uh, teaching economics for a long time. Give the audience, if they're not familiar with you, just a brief bio. We posted the bio on the uh, announcement for the uh, show this evening, but just give us a brief bio about yourself, if you would. Sure. Um, uh, as many Americans, I'm an immigrant who came to America with my parents and older brother in 1949. They're the only, uh, uh, my parents were the only ones who survived the Holocaust in their native Poland. Uh, I grew up in the um, Lower East Side and then the Bronx, uh, went to the city university system, got my PhD from Rutgers in economic geography, uh, worked in different uh, professions, starting as a New York City school teacher, and then eventually got a job teaching at uh, Ramapo in 1985, teaching finance and economics, and then eventually only finance. And I retired last July 1st after 35 years of uh, teaching finance, thousands of students. Uh, and my favorite course uh, that I taught was in the last few years, I taught the financial history of the United States, which gave students, I think, a wonderful overview of how our financial, monetary, and banking systems evolved for the past 200 plus years. And students mm. were really pleased with what they learned because there were things that they learned that were, were exposed to before, either as a high school student or a college student. So, uh, and students said uh, the things that they learned will help them in their careers uh, after they graduate. So that's very gratifying to hear from students that what you do in the classroom will have a lasting impact on them personally and uh, their careers. And hopefully uh, uh, they'll be able to make a few bucks investing wisely as well. Well, doctor, I could say it's uh, certainly a pleasure uh, to have you joining us tonight and also uh, each month. And you will be continuing your uh, teaching and your education of uh, many, many, peop many people as well. And uh, we're very excited and happy to be able to provide that forum. Of course, uh, back in 2018, you ran for the United States Senate from New Jersey. And I remember you came down to one of our meetings to introduce yourself and you're running as an independent. And I said during that meeting that you are by far the most qualified candidate uh, to hold the uh, office of United States Senator from New Jersey uh, back in 2018. And I can safely uh, uh, reiterate that tonight <laughs> that you certainly would have been a much better senatorial representative of New Jersey than uh, what we ended up uh, having uh, in uh, having with uh, Melendez, of course, winning, but also um, you would have been a better, much better Republican uh, candidate as well uh, with your intelligence and uh, your knowledge and, um, and your conservatism. So um, it's too bad you didn't win that, but I'm glad you're here with us tonight. Well, uh, I decided to become an educator when I was a high school uh, junior. And uh, it's been an interesting journey going from the New York City public schools to the uh, college level, which to me was a very stimulating environment and helping young people uh, get the tools that they need to be good uh, uh, decision makers, whether they're uh, entrepreneurs or a member of a, a corporation, whatever. Uh, it's all about skills and applying those skills to meet consumer needs. And that's what business is all about. Right. Of course, we're gonna be talking about uh, all of these issues, uh, these economic issues and the books that you're writing, that you've written and that you are continuing to write. And we're looking forward to the ones that you got coming out. But tonight, uh, just let me start uh, our topic tonight uh, with a little, um, let's see here. I did have it on there, but it doesn't look like uh, it stayed on there. Um, let me just check real quick. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. So, uh, Doctor, tonight we're naming our show. Tonight's show is the Trump administration, the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
And appropriate loaf, appropriately enough, here's this theme to uh, what I've always considered my favorite movie. And I believe very, very uh, appropriate um, as we talk about the uh, topic of discussion tonight. So oh, we're going to talk about the Trump administration, the good and the bad and the ugly. And uh, doctor, I've said really since Trump announced his candidacy that uh, he reminded me of the movie and, and the, uh, the, the uh, title of the movie. But let's talk about, first of all, let's talk about the Clint Eastwood part of the Trump administration. Let's talk about the good. Um, what do you think were some of the good, um, the good accomplishments to the Trump administration? Well, before I get into that, I just want to just briefly touch upon his announcement in June of 2015 when he drove, rode down the escalator with his wife at Trump Tower to make the announcement. And I personally didn't think he was going to uh, run for president because uh, apparently he was doing well in business. And why give that all up to uh, to go into the uh, presidential uh, Republican uh, primary, and uh, right. which was a long shot to win. I think he, initially he was polling at only 3%. And um, he was running as an outsider, a political outsider, but he really was a financial political insider because he was contributing money for decades to people on both sides of the aisle. And so uh, right. we, we knew that he didn't have a really well-grounded philosophical foundation or framework. Having said that, he missed a golden opportunity in his announcement because what he said initially really made me cringe when he talked about uh, Mexicans and others coming into the country. Uh, uh, some of them are, um, are rapists and all that. And what he could have done is made a very personal mm -hmm. statement about his own family coming from Europe and settling into the United States and how they became part of the American uh, society and make a very personal statement about immigration, that we follow the rules like other people. And he should have brought in successful immigrants from New York City and from other parts of the country to say, this is the way we do it, folks. You come to America, you're vetted before you get here, you're vetted while you're here, and you become a US citizen after five years, seven years, whatever the case may be, like my parents, they became citizens five years after they arrived in America. And I became a citizen 10 years after we arrived in America by following the rules. Mm -hmm. When you play by the rules, JR, you don't get into trouble. That's, <laughs> I think, a basic lesson of human experience. You follow some good rules and you'll never get into trouble with the law or anybody else. So having said that, he missed, I think, a huge opportunity to not only uh, demonstrate the, the fact that a lot of people thought he was lacking, not only during the campaign, but during his presidency of empathy. And that's what a lot of people think is important in the president, whether you, uh, whether you think that's, um, that you personally think that's important for a president. But again, you're appealing to tens and tens of millions of Americans in, in, uh, in the primary and in the general election. So you want to demonstrate that you have this connection with them. And he did to, at a certain level uh, uh, with his mm -hmm. rhetoric, immigration and trade and other issues. And so that's what I felt initially was, I think going to be a problem in the primary. But as we know, he succeeded. He knocked off all the uh, establishment candidates pretty easily. And he coasted to, the, uh, to victory in, in 2016. So what was the good about his presidency? And uh, I think there were several on both the domestic and international front. He campaigned mm -hmm. essentially what I've been campaigning on when I ran for the US Senate on a non-interventionist foreign policy. I think this right. is right out of the Robert Taft, Ron Paul playbook of, hey, yep. we cannot be the policemen of the world. We don't have any interest in, in, um, in other parts of the world. And he demonstrated, I think, a, a good insight, good instinct by saying, hey, let's withdraw from Afghanistan, which we're finally doing. Uh, let's withdraw mm -hmm. from uh, other parts of the world that where we don't have any na quote, national security interest. In fact, I would make the claim we have very few national security interests around the world. We have to protect our borders, which I think is critical for any nation state. Sovereignty mm -hmm. is one of the hallmarks of, of a nation state is that your borders are protected uh, from either foreign invaders, an army, or they're protected from people who want to sneak into the country without uh, being vetted properly. And we know one of the things from, uh, from history and from current situation, given the, the pandemic that we've experienced, people are coming into the country sick. And decades ago, yep. when you were sick, 
you were quarantined at Ellis Island and other places or sent back home to Europe where mm -hmm. a lot of the immigrants came from in the 19th and early 20th century. If you had TB, which was rampant in Europe and other parts of the world, you were not allowed into America, which is one of the most virulent uh, diseases uh, there is. And God knows how many immigrants, uh, uh, undocumented immigrants have come into the United States in recent years with COVID right. and, um, and uh, tuberculosis. So I think his instinct was good on the no wars and, um, and not- Doctor, getting, go ahead. Doctor, yeah, no, just let me interject there. Uh, people are able to uh, send uh, their questions in if they'd like to comment on the uh, live presentation so you can uh, give your questions uh, to us and uh, we'd be happy to entertain them. And the only other thing, and I, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you, doctor, but I wanna tell you that the constitutional Republican position is the position that George Washington held yeah. Uh, warning from his great farewell address that we should not be engaged in foreign entanglements. Yeah. And, um, and of course, um, generally the initial principles of the Republican Party, of course, we had a war that we were fighting right here on our soil and in our United States. Um, and there wasn't much, um, it wasn't really until TR and William McKinley that Republicans started to um, take this, this um, mentality that we can take uh, American ideals throughout the world. Uh, we, we believe that America is exceptional in that, uh, um, in that um, reality that you really can't duplicate what happened in this nation and any other nation in the world. And uh, so uh, I agree with you that uh, Trump was on the right track um, when the, with the uh, not wanting to get or not further escalate American involvement. Uh, throughout the yeah, world. I think I think that's one of the the, the key uh, benchmarks of um, Washington's farewell address is no far, foreign entangling alliances, commerce with all, and uh, out of peace comes what prosperity. We know that. I mean, you see what's going on in Gaza yeah. now in Israel. When you bomb each other, you, you it's destruction. Not only human destruction, but property destruction. Yeah. So out of peace comes wonderful things. It's it's, it's called uh, prosperity and uh, you, you, human development. So uh, that's one good thing. The right. other good thing is deregulation. And deregulation yes. is one of the most important ways of making an economy grow because you remove the barriers to trade and to work and to all the other things that make it possible for businesses to uh, meet uh, human needs through, uh, through the marketplace. And so deregulation, mm -hmm. which, which he... I don't have all the deregulation um, initiatives that he did, but that was, I think, uh, one of the key initiatives because he had some good free market people around him. And by the way, just to give a, 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 a congratulations to Jimmy Carter, he, that deregulation really started started under the Carter administration in the 1970s hmm. under the leadership of uh, economist Alfred Kahn, who said, who looked at all the different regulations in the country, said, we got to get rid of them because they're stifling business and they're harming consumers. So. Uh, Again, deregulation mm -hmm. is not a partisan issue. It's a common sense economic financial issue. What's the best way to organize the economy and, and different sectors? It's through the marketplace. It's through the free market. Right. The other thing he did right. was tax cuts. Yeah. I'm always in favor of tax cuts. Tax cuts are very good. Right. I wrote the book in, in the mid 90s on how to create a tax free America. It's still available on uh, Amazon, Tax Free 2000. And we're going to we talk about that in the future. Yeah. If we had we're going to have that, talk about that book. Yeah, uh, so tax cuts are always good. The problem with the tax cuts, I shouldn't say the problem, is that you should also do spending cuts. Otherwise, you can explode the, the uh, deficit, which is exactly ha what happened under Trump. So we'll talk about that as, as far as the bad goes. The other thing, he was pretty good on the Second Amendment. He said uh, the Second Amendment is a very important right that we have, uh, the right to bear arms. It's right there. It's, not, it's, uh, it's unequivocal. And I think he could have done that uh, uh, and expanded the, the concept that the American people have the right to self-defense. Even though if there wasn't a second amendment to the, to the constitution, the right of self-defense is a fundamental human right. And he should have been pounding that issue home over and over again. And I think that would have um, yep. galvanized support for 2020 that um, the Democrats are in favor of gun control, you have mystically called gun control, which really means what? The, the right of self-defense being diminished. That's what gun control means. Right. And so that, that's where, and of I course, think there was a there was a right. And there was a national reciprocity bill that got passed by the Congress, yeah. sat on uh, Mitch McConnell's desk for too long. But Trump should have took the opportunity to uh, to get that through. But uh, his administration was opposed to that national reciprocity bill. 
Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Again, uh, not being a constitutional attorney, I don't know uh, if that would have passed constitutional muster because of uh, uh, states' rights and uh, uh, state responsibility on that issue. Mm -hmm. But having said that, True. another thing he did, which helped him, uh, I think, a lot within the block committee, was all these clemencies and pardons at the end of his uh, term. I think that was key to him reaching out. And this is the empathy factor that I talked about initially. This has demonstrated his, I think, uh, willingness to say to, to people who were incarcerated for many, many years, sometimes decades, that they really paid a, 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 an incredible price to quote society for being incarcerated for a minor crime. And I think he could have expanded that. I, what I, uh, I, we'll get into that later on about the, the missed opportunities, but I think the good part of right. parts of his administration were deregulation uh, of relatively non-intervention as foreign policy, uh, tax cuts, mm -hmm. and uh, clem using the clemency and pardon powers to uh, to make sure that people are not uh, suffering in prison for years and decades. And I think uh, right. he could he could have done that throughout his administration. I think he would have uh, gotten more support as we got into 2020, which of course uh, was undermined by the pandemic. So that, that I think right. is in a nutshell, the, the good aspects of his administration, right. which he would have built upon, I think would have made 2020 a lot easier for him. Right. And doctor, let me also suggest that uh, uh, some of the other good uh, aspects of the administration was number one, uh, doctor, he beat Hillary. Yeah. That in <laughs> itself, that in itself was, uh, was a great accomplishment. One that we were very happy with uh, because we know that uh, Hillary is ideologically opposed um, to the political theory of the American founding. Um, she's opposed, she believes in a living, evolving constitution, which we, you know, which Joe Biden believes in as well, which really is essentially is a dead constitution right. because it no longer protects the natural rights of the citizens. But also we have to uh, say that the, uh, the uh, judiciary picks, the Supreme Court picks, all three picks were uh, outstanding. Um, I'm a little bit uh, dis, uh, disappointed with Gorsuch with the last uh, ruling that uh, he wrote on uh, regarding the um, the uh, applicability of the 1965 Civil Rights Act um, to uh, certain uh, designated groups and special interest groups today. But uh, I think Trump did a great job uh, with those three, especially Amy Coney uh, Barrett, who we we uh, the Constitution Republicans, we, we thought she should have been the first pick because she's uh, really extraordinary. And uh, of course, she sat under J Justice Scalia. Um, I also think, uh, Doctor, it was important <coughs> that he brought the embassy back in uh, Israel, back to Jerusalem, where it belongs. Jerusalem, of course, being the uh, capital and the traditional capital of Israel as we go back into the biblical era. And I think that was a good thing. I think it was good that he pulled us out of the Iran deal, which was unconstitutional. Uh, the Senate never voted on this deal. Um, so that was a good thing. The Iran deal pulling out of that and pulling us out of the Paris Accord, of course, which would um, significantly hurt um, natural resources and energy uh, in many, many respects. And um, also at the end, uh, doctor, he was... Uh, um, advocating um, better history, more accurate history, promoting the 1776 Commission, uh, which was a, a repudiation, if you will, or an alternative view to the 1619 yeah. project and the uh, revisionist deconstructionist theory, uh, historical theories that uh, that project um, promotes. So I thought it was very good in that respect. And we'll go back and look at some of, uh, I actually have some video that will show um, concerning, but I do think that uh, we have to remember uh, those good points that uh, Trump uh, was able to accomplish. And one other thing he did last year was uh, pull us out of the WHO, which is a really corrupt uh, uh, organization, the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're basically uh, very ineffective and have uh, they've been very counterproductive in terms of quote, public health. Yeah, no question about it. Now, uh, as we move on now, let me share another uh, video with you uh, uh, quickly, um, doctor, and uh, we'll sh show this. And um, is there anyone on stage, and can I see hands, who is unwilling tonight to pledge your support to the eventual nominee of the Republican Party and pledge 
do not run an independent campaign against that person. Again, we're looking for you to raise your hand now. Raise your hand now if you won't make that pledge tonight. standing on the Republican primary I committee. fully understand. The place where the RNC will give the nominee the nod. I fully understand. And that experts say an independent run would almost certainly hand the race over to Democrats and likely another Clinton. You can't say tonight that you can make that pledge. I cannot say I have to respect the person that if it's not me, the person that wins. If I do win and I'm leading by quite a bit, uh, that's what I want to do. I can totally make that pledge. If I'm the nominee, I will pledge. I will <laughs> not run as an independent. But uh, and I am discussing it with everybody. But I'm you know, talking about a lot of leverage. We want to win and we will win. But I want to win. As the Republican, I want to run as the Republican nominee. So tonight you can't say if another one of these was wrong. I mean, okay. this is what's wrong. He buys and sells politicians of all stripes. He's already, hey, look, look, he's already hedging his bet on the Clintons, okay? So if he doesn't run as a Republican, maybe he supports Clinton or maybe he runs as an independent. Okay. But I'd say that he's already hedging his bets because he's used to buying politicians. Well, I've given us plenty of money. If that's to be clear, you can't make it. We're, gonna, we're going to move on. You're not gonna... And there you have, uh, Doctor, the very first... Um, the very first moments of the 2016, well, it was actually 2015. It was, uh, in the, it was in the summer of the 15th where the primary was the very first um, primary um, debate. And uh, immediately, Trump is the only one who says that he would not support the nominee if it's not him. So right there sets a precedence. Yep. And of course, Rand Paul stood up. And uh, he made mention later on in uh, the debate of how the Trump had actually uh, sent contributions to the Clintons. And our position as constitutional Republicans is, is that we've always questioned his, uh, uh, his principles. Um, of course, the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are what Abraham Lincoln went back to. And we support Republicans. If you know, we talked about that uh, back in 2018 when you ran as a libertarian, but right from the very beginning, we see that Trump was really in it more for himself than he was for the principles historically of the Republican Party. And that yeah. message resonated with most with most people and most Republicans. Well, the irony is that even though he made that statement in August of 2015, he won the primary pretty easily. That, that was really, I think, mm -hmm. remarkable. But I, I just want to make another point about this, which gets into the whole bad thing about I watched election night 2016. And I stayed up, I think, till three o'clock in the morning because it, it dragged on and dragged on and dragged on. And finally, when it was announced that Trump was had enough electoral votes by winning uh, the states of uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and uh, Wisconsin, I think, he came onto the stage. <coughs> and I watched him very carefully come onto the stage. And I was reading his body language. And it, se it seemed clear to me he did not expect to win. And he was not prepared to be president because there was no transition in place the two months before the election where he gathered a team to help him with the transition if he did become president. So I think he missed a golden opportunity to bring in the top people. Now, he did have Chris Christie as, at his side, who then um, uh, was shunted aside after the uh, election. But still, he did not think he was going to win. So, so the question that I have, and no one has answered it as far as I know, maybe somebody has written a book about it, is what was his expectation in running for president, securing the nomination, and then running against Hillary Clinton, who was favored by what, 10 points. And uh, yeah. this is, I think, the great irony that he really was not prepared to be president. <coughs> and no, that, I think, was, I think that was demonstrated in who he picked around him uh, for his close advisors and his cabinet. I think he just, again, not having a coherent, philosophical vision and outlook, he should have picked people that were on board with him in terms of domestic and foreign policy. And he, I think right. that was 
that was the beginning, I think, of his problems as president. And of course, the Democrats never considered him a legitimate president, which is ironic since uh, Trump made that claim about Biden in 2020. And so here you have the Democrats right. saying that Trump was not a legitimate president, and they did everything they could in order to undermine his presidency and call for his impeachment. Yes even before he was yep. inaugurated. So again, the Democrats have a lot of explaining to do, which is pretty simple. Uh, they hated him from the get-go and saw him as the interloper. He was not one of right. the, uh, the club, a member of the club, even though he's donated to God knows how many people over the years on both sides of the aisle. But still, uh, they wanted Jeb Bush, the, the Republican establishment, I think, wanted Jeb Bush as somebody... I think he was—he was the odds-on favorite. I think at one time to win, or at least he was—he was considered the anointed one. In other words, the third Bush presidency, right. which um, right. uh, and people thought it was going to be a Bush-Clinton presidency. So let me, let's get back to the other bad things that he did. Um, spending went through the roof under under Trump. Yeah. There was no fiscal conservatism whatsoever, especially the last year yeah. in the pandemic. I think he missed an opportunity with that. Uh, the other thing is uh, from my perspective, tariffs were a horrible, horrible tool uh, that deepened the depression uh, under Hoover in the early part of the uh, depression, 1930, 31, 32, 33. And uh, tariffs are a tax. Mm -hmm. And uh, the debate is who pays the tariff? And uh, we can debate that endlessly. But let me give you a good example domestically. Let's say Governor Murphy decided to slap a tariff on Texas beef because of whatever reason, climate change, he thinks the American pe the people of New Jersey should eat less beef, and he imposes a 30% mm -hmm. tax on beef coming in. Well, who's going to pay that, uh, ta that tariff, that tax? Well, it could be the, the, uh, the beef suppliers from Texas and their profit margins would be decimated. They could pass on some mm -hmm. or all of their costs, try to, and demand would go down because uh, we know prices go up, demand goes down. And so uh, it's a mixed bag as to who pays the tariff when it comes to uh, somebody thinking that would generate a lot of revenue. Now, you're not going to generate a lot of revenue because uh, demand goes down if, you tr if uh, producers try to increase their prices. So that's a basic point. Mm -hmm. So t tariffs, I think, are uh, a very uh, blunt instrument. And they're really another tax. I mean, it's just another tax on the American people, American uh, importers, uh, foreign producers. So there's nothing good about a tariff unless you, of course, are protected by a tariff, like the early uh, iron manufacturers in the United States back in the 1820s. They loved tariffs, and so did other people throughout the 19th century. The Republicans they, did. Yes, I mean, the, the Republicans. Wigs, the Whigs and the Republicans yeah, did. Yeah, that was part of the, um, of the uh, Henry Clay Nationalist. Before program. the Industrial Age. Yeah. I, uh, again, this is crony capitalism. It's not free market capitalism. Right. So I think we have to make that point. Um, Another thing is the wall. There's a lot of controversy about the wall. And uh, years ago, I was in favor of a wall because I thought that was a, a common sense way to deal with it. But the growing up in the era of the Cold War, I remember the Berlin Wall going up and that kept people from leaving the country. So I think a yeah. wall is a double-edged sword. I think there's a better way of dealing with uh, illegal immigration than having a wall. I think it sends a terrible message. Um, and again, Trump could have gone to the border and say, we welcome immigrants who follow the procedure like my and services did to come to America. Again, right. showing the empathy factor and that we are welcoming to immigrants. And so right. again, he could, he could have brought in Hispanics from uh, Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and California say, these are the people that came in legally. Look at them, they're thriving in America. Right. And there are people overseas that are waiting five, 10 years to come to America legally. And people are coming across yes. the border and they're getting all sorts of benefits because they, they come here and uh, not following the rules. So I think that was a great missed opportunity. Um, I agree. Then and Doc, don't yeah. you think, and Doc, don't you think then what we've said and what we've suggested all along is that the rules on the books are already there. Yeah. The rules of naturalization are constitutionally created by the Congress and it's the executive, it's the president's duty to execute those laws. Those laws are got, uh, created to protect American citizens first. Yep. And all he had to do, and I don't understand why we can't get uh, this through the representatives that we elect, uh, we can't get through to them, just enforce the rules of naturalization. Mm -hmm. um, make it, that will be the great deterrent. For those coming over the border illegally, they'll know that when they get caught, they'll be deported. 
And uh, if they want to come to this country, they have to go by the, about the legal process of being here five years and not breaking the law and uh, swearing an oath to, to, to support the Constitution, to learn about what our, uh, what our, the ideal, our American ideal of freedom and liberty and natural rights are all about. That's all part of the naturalization process. And yeah. millions of people have successfully done it like you and your parents did. And uh, that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be worrying about a wall. The, the, the deterrent will be there when they know they're going to get caught and deported if they don't come back the right way. And of course, that means supporting ICE and the federal agencies that uh, uh, apprehend these illegals and then send them back. Well, here's, the, here's what I, pro, I proposed over the years is that uh, we came here, we had sponsorship, which means that someone is going to be responsible for your well-being instead of being a ward of the state and being on the welfare system. So right. that's another message we should be giving to immigrants. Yeah, that's a good point. If you come here legally, you're going to have to have a sponsorship. And if you come here illegally, you're not going to get any welfare benefits and you're going to be on your own. And, um, and if you break the law, you're going to be deported. So again, uh, we should say America is open to legal immigration as long as there's sponsors that will uh, help you acclimate to America, learn the language, learn the rules, get a job and uh, become part of the American uh, economy. And I think that's just a, right. a common sense approach to this thing. And there are a couple other yep. bad things that uh, Trump did, which I think we have to discuss, which I think undermined his um, credibility as a fiscal conservative. And, uh, and uh, which one was the uh, cap on uh, state and local taxes. I think that hurt him a lot politically. Yes. And it was just bad economics. Especially Ten thousand dollars. That's an arbitrary number. Where's that ten thousand yeah. come from? Why not fifteen thousand? Right. Why not eighteen thousand? And uh, yep. now, I don't know what the calculus it went hurt, into. It that. hurt New Jersey residents, Doc. It hurt New Jersey residents. It hurt California, New York yeah. residents as yeah. well. And well, it was we almost don't... done as if it was almost done and supported because those are the states that, of course, were the most um, anti-Trump. Yeah. But uh, that's not the way to, uh, that's no. not, that's not the uh, equal application of the law. That's why I wrote tax free 2000 taxes have become a political tool rather than a, 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 a common sense way of raising funds for the government that based yep. upon constitutional spending. And of course we don't have constitutional spending. That's topic for another day. But, um, mm -hmm. if we had a low tax, I think it would be beneficial to the, to the, uh, country as a whole, to the economy, to workers especially, because there would be uh, uh, higher wages as uh, uh, companies would be able to pay uh, higher wages to attract the best workers for their, uh, for their businesses. So again, I think the salt mm -hmm. cap was a huge, huge mistake. Yes. It was probably one of no the worst question. mistakes of his presidency. The other thing, it was really which is, which is uh, why I wrote uh, Why the Federal Reserve Sucks, that was published in 2019, is that during the campaign of tw in 2015 and 2016, he went on MSNBC and said, well, you have a big fat bubble developing because of all the easy money since the Great Recession of 2007, 2008. And so right. what does he do in 2019? He berates the Fed chairman uh, uh, of the Federal Reserve for not creating enough money to b yeah. uh, uh, yep. uh, blow up the bubble even greater, which was pricked in the... Uh, COVID crisis in, in 2020. Yep. And then what did the Fed do? They immediately goosed the money supply by $4 trillion. And here we are, and inflation is roaring ahead. The biggest inflation mm -hmm. we've had in, in years and years and years because of uh, the Federal Reserve, which supposedly is independent. Yep. But the, the record shows uh, the president of the United States gets the monetary policy he wants, even though he has no direct control over the Federal Reserve, whether it was Nixon in 72, right whether it was, um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 I'm trying to think of well, in 2012 and so on and so forth. Presidents get the, far, the monetary policy that they want in order to goose the economy to make it look better than it otherwise would be because of all the cheap money right. that's out there. So these are some of the bad things that Trump did, yeah. which I think- Doctor, <coughs> yeah, doctor, I, I wanna get your input on an article that I have here. And you may even know this gentleman. Um, he wrote this article. Uh, it's the economic policy failures of the Trump administration, and it's written by Jeffrey Tucker. Sure, Jeff, and, I know uh, very well, yeah. Good. So uh, I want your thoughts on this. Uh, just um, indulge me for a moment. Sure. Uh, this is under the title of philosophy, <coughs> and I really think this really speaks uh, deeply to the attraction that the people had uh, and still continue to have uh, to Trump. 
uh, he, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Tucker or Jeffrey Tucker writes, um, from 2015, even from his first public speeches following his presidential run, it was clear that Donald Trump was not a conservative in the Reagan tradition, but was selling something of which he had no experience in politics during most lifetimes. He was reviving what I called right Hegelianism. Well, that, imagines, that imagines the trajectory of history culminating in the idea of a nation state unified and managed by a great leader. Mm -hmm. In other interactions of this ideology in the interwar period, this unity is economic, social, cultural, religious, and racial. But this is not an American ideal. It's not about freedom, rights, and the rule of law, much less the limits of government. And imagine it's not a head of a state that manages the government, but rather an overarching central leader that manages the whole country in all its aspects. The U.S. Constitution was structured not only to prevent such a system, but to work as a rebuke to it. The first three words, we the people, were chosen carefully to embrace a self-managing society, not one ruled by a person over and over everyone else. There are many instanations of right Hegelian ideology, but all end up relying around trade protectionisms, migration restrictions, and the centralization of power in the executive. These were the main themes of the 2016 Trump campaign. These themes were not, however, what drew the Republican rank and file to his candidacy. Instead, what the party regulars liked about him was his brash and aggressive willingness to stand up to his enemies. His anger and relentless attacks thrilled people in the party who were fed up with playing nice to the left. That allowed them to overlook the aspects of his ideological, ideological push that stood in hard contradiction to anything like traditional American conservatism, much less classical liberalism. Yeah, J Jeff nailed it right there. He really did. I he think did. that uh, I'm he sure really I read did. that article because uh, Jeff is now the editorial director of. Um, or the executive director, I forgot his exact title, of the American Institute of Economic Research, which I worked for back in the late 70s and early 80s. So uh, I have a lot of respect for the organization that was founded during the Great Depression by Colonel E.C. Harwood, and they write great articles on their website, AIER.org, and I would urge all the listeners to go to the website, and they're just articles about COVID. They've been taking a lead in the COVID with the Great Barrington Declaration, which leads me to another bad aspect of the Trump administration. I think um, he did not use his um, his pulpit wisely for COVID because I think Fauci and the rest of them went to him and said, uh, you better call for a national emergency, otherwise uh, millions of people are going to die early on. And those were numbers based from uh, England that were totally erroneous in terms of modeling uh, COVID. And so, uh, and then the next thing he did, he compounded the problem by giving all the stimulus money, which of course the federal government didn't have. So the Federal Reserve had to monetize the, all the debt that the, uh, that the federal government undertook in order to pay these benefits, which prolonged mm -hmm. unemployment for a lot of people. We're still seeing the, the remnants of that with Biden increasing the yeah. uh, stimulus payments. So again, here's an example of government intervention in the economy, in society, in health, mm -hmm. in medicine, that really distorts the economy and prolonged probably the, mm -hmm. uh, the COVID uh, uh, response. And uh, mm -hmm. he's now taking credit for the vaccine, which is really not a vaccine. It's, it's a gene therapy that's uh, been around a while, right. but it's not been tested thoroughly. So we don't know what the long-term mm -hmm. consequences are, but today the uh, CDC announced if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks. Well, there are people who have been arguing that you don't have to wear masks, even if you're not vaccinated. As long as you're healthy, mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. So I think Trump missed the opportunity with COVID. And here's the uh, point I wanna make, which is I think critical. Instead of relying on Fauci and Bricks and other people in his administration, he should have convened a forum of different perspectives mm -hmm. on this and said, here mm -hmm. are some of the smartest people in the country. Let's hash out what people think this virus is all about, this COVID is all about, and what is the best protocol to follow? Because people early on were using hydroxychloroquine to treat it successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, now people are using ivermectin successfully, even though it's not... Um, uh, prescribed for it. Again, here's another mm -hmm. example of the FDA determining what the doctor-patient relationship should be in terms of uh, usage of medicines for uh, ailments. 
And that's why mm -hmm. I wrote my book on universal medical care to really get the government out of the way of medical care decisions, because that's a very private decision between the doctor and patient. So I think Trump missed the opportunity and he should not have taken mm -hmm. the lead in these uh, uh, daily briefings. He should, he, um, immediately he should have convened a, a conference that could have been shown on all, all the networks, C-SPAN, and bring in the top people from around the country, from around the world and say, what's this all about? How do we deal with it? What's the best way for the American people to protect themselves? And I think Governor DeSantis did it best. You protect the vulnerable, because that's where it was starting in Washington State in the nursing homes. And then from there, yeah. You say, okay, if you've got underlying conditions, if you have a compromised immune system, uh, and we know now if, you're, if your vitamin D level is, is low and your uh, yep. vitamin B1 level is low, you may be in big trouble mm -hmm. in, in your immune system fighting off pathogens, which is what our immune system is uh, supposed to do. And if you are elderly and obese and all these other problems, you're, you're in deep, deep trouble. And that's what the data show yeah. that uh, the elderly have been the uh, greatest victims of this. And of course we had the nursing home fiascos in, uh, in New York state and New Jersey and the governors yes. have not been uh, taking Terrible. the test as they should have been for their Terrible. egregious decision-making regarding yeah. uh, bringing positive uh, uh, COVID patients back into the nursing home. So again, I think Trump, I think that really hurt his candidacy in 2020 because all they did talk about was how he was responsible for the hundreds of thousands of deaths in America, which to me is uh, just an- uh, It's unfair. It's, it's beyond unfair. It's, it's, it's yeah. really dismissive of the notion that our medical and healthcare is our responsibility. I don't call up Washington yes. when I'm sick. I call up my doctor, whether it's a specialist <laughs> or my internist and say, hey, I think I've got a problem, I need to see you. But uh, this is the problem we have in America. Statism has been galloping for the last half century or more. And uh, yep. this is the result of pro the progressive ideology starting from the Wilson administration, yep. that the government right. is there to protect you, which is the greatest myth we have in our uh, culture. And I think, and more and more people are buying into that myth. And I think that's yeah, why I want right. to do these shows with you to get the word out that Good. you are an individual that's responsible for your life, not the government. And I think that's the message that right. Republicans, libertarians should get together and sound that yep. message all over the country. And I think we have to have a cultural change before I think we can have a political change because there are even Republicans that buy into the welfare state. And that's the problem. No question. And uh, Doc, I, you're, uh, you're you're hitting it on the head. Let's uh, now let's uh, move over to the uh, ugly part of yeah. uh, what we've seen here with the administration. I want to start with uh, two videos uh, that I'm going to play back to back for us. But watch this and uh, give me your remarks. An archaic system. You look at the rules of the Senate, even the rules of the House, but the rules of the Senate and some of the things you have to go through. It's it's really a bad thing for the country, in my opinion. They are archaic rules. And maybe at some point, we're going to have to take those rules on because for the good of the nation, things are going to have to be different. You can't go through a process like this. Okay, and that's one. So what he's uh, essentially talking about uh, there, uh, doctor, and let me get the other one up real quickly, and then we'll talk about both. I have an article too where I have the right to do whatever I want as president, but I don't even talk about that. We have a streaming issue there. He'll just hold on. It's a thing called Article 2. Nobody ever mentions Article 2. More importantly, Article 2 allows me to do whatever I want. Article 2 would have allowed me to fire him. So it sounds but like I wasn't going to, going to fire You know why? because I watched Richard Nixon go around firing everybody and that didn't work out too well. So very simply, Article 2 would allow me to do. I could have done anything I wanted. I don't even bring it up because we don't even get there. Absolutely, I have Article 2. It gives me all of these rights at a level that nobody what has ever seen. What started out as a joke has turned into a multi-billion dollar movement so, fueled by we'll, rocket emojis, no, Shiba Inu no, memes, no, and Elon Musk. So how did an internet trend from 2013 become one of the world's most popular cryptocurrency? Okay, hold on one second there, Doc, here we go. All right, um, so we see there, first of all, um, Trump questioning the uh, rules of the Congress. 
Yeah. And of course, what he's what he's really essentially saying is, is that he's questioning the system of checks and balances. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That the Constitution, the structure of the Constitution provides, and of course, Madison uh, and the founders uh, created the Constitution really to be uh, the best protector of the natural rights of the people, be, largely through the separation of powers um, uh, doctrine, and yet quite. Trump is questioning that. And then he goes on to talk about Article 2 and uh, saying he can do uh, Article 2 gives him a lot, which if you read Article 2, um, there are very limited enumerated duties uh, applied to the executive office. Um, of course, he is the executor of the laws which uh, the Congress passes. He also can negotiate in foreign treaties. He becomes the commander in chief during wartime. And of course, war has to be um, constitutionally declared by the Congress. Right. And uh, so we see all of the different um, really and uh, he really not knowing, uh, for lack of a better word, an ignorance of uh, the Constitution. And uh, really, the president should be a uh, should be a great student of the Constitution, because it is the Constitution upon which he swears to support. Well, what are your if, thoughts? Well, I've been saying for decades, we don't have a constitutional government anymore because Article 2, Section 8 outlines the responsibilities of the federal government. And if you look at the federal budget and the far, our foreign policy, there's a huge disconnect between what's authorized by the Constitution and what the federal government actually does. And that's why I'm concerned about where we're headed. And as we see this under the Biden administration, that we're headed in a direction that Hayek uh, uh, identified in uh, 1944 in his book, The Road to Serfdom where the government mm -hmm. literally controls every aspect of our lives. And given the fact that uh, Biden has said there will, no, there will not be pass, uh, vaccine passports, but he's really uh, kicking the, uh, putting the ball into the court of private businesses. So they will uh, be under pressure to require passports for, um, for uh, a lot of things, whether it's work or travel. And by the way, th th it's illegal from what I understand based upon Robert Kennedy Jr.'s uh, Children's Health Defense Health, health uh, Defense website that uh, it's illegal for employers to mandate uh, employees taking an, an experimental drug, which is what this is. So, and sure. now I, I received I received an email from a travel company that we've been using over the years to go to Europe and other parts of the world, and they're requiring vaccines to travel. And so, uh, since yeah. I am not a, an advocate of this, passports. Yeah, and so this is very troubling that if you want to go to a traveling today, you may not be able to do so. So um, I don't think the air, because I think that'll hurt their businesses quite a bit, but I think the cruise lines may go in that direction that you'll be required to have um, a vaccine on, on the cruise ships. But having said that, mm. um, yeah, Trump, again, I think this hurt, hurt him with a lot of independence that they saw him as the, uh, as the cult of personality and therefore yes. they felt that uh, it was going to be a South American dictatorship if he were reelected. And I think that's what turned off a lot of the suburban voters. And that's what the, I think the exit poll shows that a lot of suburban voters right. in the swing states uh, uh, flipped to Biden and uh, that cost him the uh, election in 2020. So again- uh, Look, doc, doctor, doctor, let me share one more video sure. uh, that I want to discuss with you. And I think really this was the um, quintessential moment of the debates. Um, the first debate, and I believe that uh, we'll watch this here and then we'll discuss it. Your administration uh, directed federal agencies to end racial sensitivity training that addresses white privilege or critical race theory. Why did you decide to do that, to end racial sensitivity training? And do you believe that there is systemic racism in this country, sir? I ended it because it's racist. I ended it because a lot of people were complaining that they were asked to do things that were absolutely insane, that it was a radical a revolution that was taking place in our military, uh, in our schools, all over the place. And you know it, and so does what, everybody what, what else. Radical, and he would know. What is oh, radical totally about racist. racial sensitivity training? If you were a certain person, you had no status in life. It was sort of a reversal. And if you look at the people, we would pay people hundreds of thousands of dollars to teach very bad ideas and frankly, very sick ideas 
and, and really they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. We have to go back to the core values of this country. They were teaching people that our country is a horrible place. It's a racist place. And they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. Vice President Biden? Nobody's doing that. He's just, he's uh, racist. He just don't care. Okay, doctor. So um, it's not so much that where Trump was wrong. I think Trump was right, but, and he, when he said that, when he made the men, when he made mention that uh, the historically our values, that's where he could have took the argument and talked about natural rights. Yeah. He could have talked about the principles of the declaration. He could have talked about the constitution. He could have talked about Republican history. Uh, th there's no such thing as systemic racism. Uh, this is the first nation in the world that fought a war to end slavery. This is a, the Republican Party was the party that uh, abolished slavery and gave due process to all of the freed slaves and gave the freed slaves the right to vote. Uh, all of these things, if he knew about the Republican history, um, he could have uh, articulated that argument. And because um, uh, Chris Wallace poses the question as if it's fact, that it's a fact that there's systemic racism and there's not. And Trump should have jumped on that and talked about all of our great um, historical um, accomplishments as the Republican Party and uh, in fulfilling the philosophy of the Declaration and the principles of the Constitution. In my estimation, he lost the election right there because he was unable to articulate uh, the right answer. It was, a, it was a truthful answer, but it wasn't elaborate enough. It didn't lack the weight that uh, that uh, question really needed to be answered with. What, what he should have said is that how could there be systemic racism in America when we have the most widespread anti-discrimination laws in, in, in world history since the civil yeah. 64 Civil Rights Act? And so um, he could have said that uh, this law does not allow discrimination in, and he could have listed all the things, employment, uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And he said, uh, it's illegal to discriminate against people based upon uh, race, color, creed, and so on and so forth. So how could that be systemic yeah. racism? And by the way, uh, if, if, there's, if there is systemic racism, why didn't, the Biden, why didn't the Obama Biden administration do anything about it? They were there for eight years. I mean, <laughs> he could have yeah. turned it back on that. See, this is what you have to do in, in a debate is, is use a little jujitsu and point out that the other guy was uh, ha was in charge. And if there's anything, he's part of the problem. If you claim there's systemic racism, then uh, Biden has perpetuated it as, as vice president with his with Obama, who was the first African-American president. So uh, if, mm -hmm. if, if, that, if uh, there's systemic racism, why didn't he address it through executive orders if he couldn't get any legislation passed, which was unnecessary because we have these widespread anti-discrimination laws already on the books. No question about it. And the other thing, too, is we're talking about, you know, the ugly aspect of the Trump administration. The man was uh, impeached twice. Uh, we can question um, the motivation. We could question the um, uh, evidence in that regard. Of course, it was a democratically controlled Congress. But just to put yourself in that position, doctor. Yeah. I mean, he, he could have avoided putting himself in either of those different positions. And I just want to share another uh, example of um, some of the uh, ugliness that, that occurred. And uh, one of those was when he called down to Georgia to talk about mustering up votes yeah. um, prior to the Georgia election. Um, and it was recorded saying, you got to get me 11,000 votes and just something that you would never imagine a president would be uh, talking about. Yeah. And of course, it's unfair to just say Trump was that way. We could talk about LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, all of his improprieties for a week. Sure. Um, let alone the Clinton administration. So, but also the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the whole idea of this rally that occurred um, on January 6th and then thinking that President or Vice President Pence could somehow nullify the election and he yeah. should do it. I mean, here we get into the uh, utter ignorance of the Constitution and the American people, doc doctor, they have to require more intellectual rigor and more constitutional literacy from their candidates. And that starts from local government right up to the president. Yeah. Let me say two things about how Trump could have undercut his opponents right from the get-go. 
because they were saying mm -hmm. he's a Russian agent, there's a Russian infiltration, Russia uh, supported Trump during the 2016 campaign. He should have said, hey, if you think there is a, uh, a Russian uh, infiltration of my campaign, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an independent commission of uh, Republicans and Democrats headed by Alan Dershowitz, the eminent mm -hmm. uh, Harvard professor. And if he mm -hmm. finds that there was, uh, there was Russian collusion between me or my campaign and Russia, I will resign after they find, if they find that out. And all the people who claim that there was a Russian interference uh, and, there, and there wasn't, they should resign because they, they made an egregious uh, allegation regarding uh, uh, this president and his, his uh, staff. And that would have undermined them because they would have said, oh, no, no, we're not going to resign if, if uh, they don't find anything. So then, then there's an old expression growing up in the Bronx, put up or shut up. I mean, I think that's what he should have said to them <laughs> in, in a very nice yeah. way. Or you could say, put up or shut up. Uh, and he could have done that. As far as the, ins the so-called insurrection, it was the lamest insurrection in the history of uh, the world. Yeah, it wasn't an insurrection. And he made a mistake by having the rally in the first place. But having said, having had the rally, what the people who went to the Capitol should have done is they should have had a, a Colin Ka uh, Kaepernick uh, uh, moment and taken a knee and said, we pray for the future of this country if, uh, under Joe Biden. That's what they should have done. That would have been a great photo op instead of doing what they did. Because you've got, to, you've got to turn the tables on these people. Because now, as I pointed out in my last presentation, uh, uh, that Donald Trump is going to be the Herbert Hoover of the 21st century for the Democrats. Mm. They're going to run, they're going to show pictures of the insurrection and tie that to that Trump and the Republicans saying, do you really want the Republicans yep. to, of, of um, the Congress in the future? And this is the guy that um, gave us an insurrection on January 6th to overturn our democracy, which of course is, is, yeah. is not true. But the point is, it's a great talking point and a great visual for the Democrats to run on for the next who knows how many election cycles. Right, we talk, we're we talking about the ugly part of it. We can't uh, end this conversation, Doc, without talking about Twitter. Uh, yeah. Right after the, tw the, the so-called, an insurrection is an organized movement by uh, paramilitary uh, or military um, uh, it's a coordinated event. That was not a coordinated event. That was just a bum rush. Um, so that's the first thing we should clarify. But Trump, after it, says that uh, he loves these those people and and uh, and he was and he he was uh, he was favorable towards um, to, to these people and what they did. And of course, that's a disaster. And we have tweet after tweet after for the four years of where he's in, engaging in uh, really mindless uh, petty. Um, uh, uh, confrontations with personalities and people, yep. uh, all things that uh, president uh, really he should be focused on um, much, much more uh, in-depth and uh, greater detailed uh, objectives. And, uh, and that was one of the things. And this, uh, this, in my estimation, you know, there's a lot of people who are uh, Trump supporters who are part of the Constitutional Republican movement. And I can... I, like them, agree with the uh, disappointment that we had uh, prior to the 2016 with the Republican representatives and the frustration that we had, whether it seemed like the Clintons and Hillary is, gets, gets away with literal murder and the Democrats getting away and Comey getting away and the FBI becoming politicized and on and on it goes. They call it, they, they, like, the they like to call it a swamp, which I uh, consider the swamp to be the administrative and bureaucratic state. But I can identify with all the things that Trump supporters identify with. I just differ with them on Trump being the answer to them. I believe the answer is in going back to the Constitution, going back to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, and the Republican um, who will who will do that. As Abraham Lincoln said, we must readopt the principles of the Declaration and constitute and create policy in relation to the principles of that great declaration. Well, I think you're right. The Twitter thing, I think, was um, unfortunate because he didn't speak directly to the people. He thought he was. But you need to speak to the reporters and have news conferences. If he had done a news conference every week, every two weeks, to say, listen, the reason I ran is because we've had bipartisanship failed policies in America. That's what he should have said. And I'm here as an yeah. outsider looking in, and I'm saying, Things could be better if we followed some basic principles and rules that would make the economy stronger and would uh, 
uh, give us more respect in the world. And he say, these are the things we need to do. And instead, he, he engaged in personal attacks. Now, a lot of Trumpers like, people, like that because they thought he was yeah. a, a good brawler. Uh, but the point is, the president is, is not supposed to be a brawler. The president is supposed to be articulate a vision for the country that would be yes. quote, for the general welfare. And I think that's where he missed his opportunity. I think uh, yeah. uh, there, there, were, uh, there were people who supported him uh, despite his failures, uh, his, his uh, shortcomings. And I think there are people who really were turned off by him. I mean, I, I've been on some threads where people really despise the guy. They really hate him. Uh, they think he's worse in many ways than uh, dictators in South America and Europe. And so yeah. Uh, yeah. when you have that perception, that means you're doing something wrong because there yeah. very few people were. Uh, and the irony is, here's the irony, JR, is that the Bush family got us involved in two horrific wars in the Mideast. I mean, mm -hmm. really horrific wars. And Terrible. yet hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Christians were, were, were uh, systematically routed out of Iraq, which had a, a peaceful coexistence between um, Christians and, and uh, Muslims. And, um, yep. and, and, and Bush is, is now considered a, 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 a decent president for, uh, despite his lying us into war. I mean, and this mm -hmm. is getting back to, the, I just want to end with this because this is important. Liz Cheney is now considered a saint because she considers Trump uh, articulating the big lie about the election. Well, when her mm -hmm. father, the vice president, was on t national television giving us the big lie about weapons of mass destruction, I didn't hear her talk about the big lie of the, of the weapons of mass destruction yep. in Iraq. So uh, no Liz Cheney is, is, is the, probably the, the biggest hypocrite in my lifetime in American politics, is that it's okay to lie yeah. us into war, uh, and she claimed that Trump is a, is a danger to our democracy, which shows you how weak she thinks our democracy is. Yeah, well, it's a good point. And of course, her father was a neoconservative, a neocon, and uh, he was a war hawk. And I always thought it very strange why uh, Donald Trump would appoint... Um, John Bolton yeah. um, to the United Nations because he, he uh, was it the United Nations or maybe he was secretary of uh, no defense, national security advisor. Whatever, Na yeah, national, national security advisor. And he is, and he is a, he is a, he is an outspoken neocon and war hawk. And then uh, yep. of course, Trump um, didn't want to get uh, any more further interventions. Uh, and the other thing too, doc, that we have to remember is, is that, uh, you know, Trump's failures, um, can also be as a, attributed to his lack of coalition. He couldn't build coalitions. Right. And that's what a president has to do. That's what Abraham Lincoln did. Uh, there's many different factors in the Republican Party. And it's very disappointing when the people who support Trump uh, immediately write off people like myself, uh, anyone who has any kind of uh, criticism or any you, engages in critical thinking and evaluates yeah situation to make and immediately write us off oh well you're not you know you're a you're a never trump or i voted for the man twice so i don't think you know, i could be and a lot of other constitutional republicans can be considered never trumpers when you vote for the man twice however uh, we have to evaluate um, the job that he did and he was unable to build those coalitions that are so vital and and didn't conduct himself like a statesman uh, and really as a role model and an example, and you and I are going to talk a lot about Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the months ahead and the New Deal. And all, But one thing about Roosevelt was he was a great speaker. He was a coalition builder. Uh, he came to the American people in their homes on the radio and he called them friends. Yeah. He said, my friends. Yep. And uh, he was the first president to do that. And that's really the mentality um, that Trump uh, needed to... Uh, to uh, to to show uh, and also he who did he surround himself with Steve Bannon uh, I mean how could you do how could you get anything out of that man um, that was going to be uh, pro uh, American ideal and American political theory uh, initial American political theory and then of course the nepotism within the family yeah and uh, pointing uh, pointing his children and and his uh, son-in-law and you know, uh, doctor, there was not, for the first time in Republican Party history in 2020, there was not a Republican Party platform. Yeah. They just grandfathered the one over from 16 and they said, well, we're going to grandfather this, this over. What's important is the Trump agenda, quote unquote. 
Yeah. And it's, so here's the call to personality. Here's a man, a demagogue who's completely taken over the party and he's not articulating the principles and the great history and heritage of the Republican Party. I mean, Steve Bannon goes in there and talks to him about uh, Andrew Jackson and how great Andrew Jackson was, um, who the Whig Party was formed in order to, uh, to, uh, to run up against, to confront. And instead of looking at Lincoln, Trump's looking at Jackson, who again was a was a, was a very divisive, and uh, ruled as a as a monarch in many ways. They called him King Andrew Jackson. So, a lot of a uh, lot of things to discuss uh, regarding Trump's presidency. No question. Well, I think is uh, this was a missed opportunity by Trump, and I think the, the reason it was is because he was unprepared. I think that's uh, yes. When I had a radio show, I was prepared. I, I, sometimes a guest didn't show up and I had to uh, fill the airwaves with the commentary and uh, call-ins and what have you. And so you have to be prepared. When you go into the classroom and teach for an hour, uh, 40 minutes, you have to be prepared. That's, that's, like, uh, that's like having a movie in front of the students and you have to engage them for an hour, 40 minutes. And so he was yeah. not engaging with the American people. The problem I think that Trump had which carried over from his campaign to his presidency is that because he was drawing such huge crowds, he thought that was enough to, for his presidency to be successful. That quote, the love that the crowd showed to him was, uh, was enough for him to feel confident that whatever oh, yeah. he was going to do was going to resonate with his voters. But you have to expand no. that because he only won the presidency by what, 80,000 votes. If you look at the states that he won, that get, put him over the top, it was a, it was a total of 80,000 vote. votes. Otherwise, yeah. he would have lost the presidency. So uh, again, uh, what we're seeing now is the presidency uh, or the uh, presidential election being very close affairs, even though the Electoral College may not show that. But the popular vote, even though they, um, it's skewed because of California giving the Democrats a three, four million uh, uh, plurality, yeah. uh, it, it, it skews yeah. the popular vote. But it's a very yeah. close electorate. I mean, uh, people yeah. are split down the middle. And uh, the question yeah. is, where do we go from here? And that's, I think, going to be the interesting part uh, for the next uh, several election cycles, whether it's the midterm in 22, the 24 right. election. And uh, I think a lot of people have uh, Trump fatigue, even within the Republican Party who supported him. I think they want a new face. In fact, uh, historically, no president that was a one-termer ran, ran for uh, election uh, uh, I take that back. Uh, Grover, Grover Cleveland. Cleveland. Grover Cleveland. Yeah. He was the only one Democrat. that, that uh, served two non-consecutive terms. So right. he's the only one, um, the president, whether it's William right. Howard Taft, um, uh, Jimmy Carter, and George Walker Bush. And, um, and we'll see what happens in 2024. But I can't believe that Trump is going to run again. I just... Uh, I was wrong in 2016. Right. Maybe I'll be wrong again in 2024. But again, he'll be 78 in, in, in 2024. Yeah. Well, you see, uh, you see now, Doc, that uh, really there's a civil war that's developing between the Trump loyalists, the loyalist, and the non-loyalist. Yeah. Um, we're the constitutional Republicans. We say go back to the Declaration, go back to the Constitution, whereas Trump says, you know, I can do it all for us, which we right. talked about with the the remarks that were made. Um, in the uh, piece that I had written. But the other thing too, uh, before we close up, uh, Doc, is that uh, Trump, instead of making enemies of the press, uh, right. the Ronald Reagan was a master at, uh, at uh, his charm and a smile and uh, the witty things that he would say that uh, even Sam Donaldson loved and respected right. Ronald Reagan, if you remember. Right. And, uh, and it's important. And of course, FDR shared the same thing as well as the other presidents. Um, uh, not so much Nixon and Johnson, but they were able to uh, work with the press and, and, and try to lead the press in the right direction and, and say if and call them out uh, when there is uh, uh, information that may not be accurate out there. But Trump right. just built that wall right up, the divisive wall between him and the press. And all the people, of course, of the nation are very frustrated with the press. They don't you know, if you're a Republican, you're not watching CNN, you're not watching MSNBC, you're watching Fox. Right. Well, um, Trump could have been able, Trump could have um, really built and tried to educate and try to lead in that respect. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was a master of using the press. And of course, the press was much different uh, without television and radio in 1860 than it is in 2021. But uh, Trump could have helped himself 
if uh, he was much more amicable and much more cultivating and looking to uh, to teach and to grow. But like you said, uh, he just was ill-equipped and he wasn't uh, prepared. It's, which is unfortunate because um, uh, he was the first really non uh, elect non government official to become president since Eisenhower, and right. that's really remarkable. Um, and Eisenhower, of course, was the uh, supreme commander during World War II, so he had a lot of credentials. Yeah. And um, that's right. But so Trump, I missed an opportunity to really put an agenda forward by saying, "Hey, listen, things haven't been working out too, too well because of." Uh, this bipartisanship, which people think is is, is the uh, lodestone for uh, politics in Washington. But the point is, look right. where we are. We have huge deficits. We have uh, military yeah. commitments all around the world. Uh, we have some regulations that are strangling uh, small and medium-sized businesses. We got to free up the economy. We got to reduce spending taxes and um, and and not uh, and not uh, create uh, all this money that is devalue debasing the currency. So again, when you don't have a, a, a coherent philosophy of governing, I think you, you're just going to rely on your personality. And that's exactly what happened to him. Great, doctor. Uh, we've had an excellent conversation. I hope our audience has enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you'll like and share this video um, with your friends and family. Um, I'm sure there's information in here um, that you can use uh, in further discussion as we uh, uh, do an evaluation of the Trump administration, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I want to uh, appreciate, uh, thank you, doctor, for joining me. We'll see you next month. And uh, again, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you, JR. I look forward to it. Uh, once you're a teacher, you're always a teacher. So uh, I, I consider this part of my um, uh, teaching resume. Uh, and uh, we can reach, hopefully, uh, lots of people with uh, good ideas about what this country needs to get it back on track. Well, I certainly appreciate it. And we're happy to be a conduit uh, for you to continue your teaching. Um, you're a remarkably intelligent man and I have the utmost respect for you and have always considered you a mentor. And uh, I'll, I'll be happy to see you next month when we come back and uh, hope to further educate our citizens. But thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you, audience. As we, thank you, sir. And as we, uh, conclude the show, we must remember what Abraham Lincoln said, that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution will provide liberty for all if we obey and if we adhere to it and support it. Thank you very much.